just pen words I'm interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. Uh, the date is June 25th, uh, 1970. I'm in the Lieutenant Governor's office in the state capitol interviewing Lieutenant Governor George Nye of Oklahoma. Uh, George, I wonder if you could tell us uh, where you were born and a little bit about your family background. Well, I was born uh, in McAllister, Oklahoma, June the 9th, 1927. I was the fourth son of Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur Nye. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Irene Crockett. Uh, my family uh, was later added to uh, with the addition of a sister, uh, Mary Nye. So I was the fourth son in a family of five with a younger sister. Uh, my parents, uh, Wilbur Nye, uh, came from a Missouri farm, we ran away from home uh, at the age, I believe, the best I remember, 13, and came to uh, uh, Oklahoma, and uh, as he grew up, finished growing up here, uh, making his own living, uh, he later met and married my mother, Eileen Crockett. Uh, my mother's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Lewin Crockett owned a grocery store in McAllister, and uh, after my dad and mother were married, uh, he became a partner in the grocery store. So I was raised in McAllister, uh, in a grocery neighborhood grocery family, attended McAllister Public Schools, graduating from there in 1945. A lot of people today are not familiar with the neighborhood grocery. The people growing up today certainly are not. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the neighborhood grocery as you saw it from the inside. Well, I think it's particularly uh, interesting uh, keeping in mind that the shopping cart which revolutionized the grocery and merchandising business was uh, uh, invented and uh, manufactured first here in Oklahoma City. Prior to the shopping cart, it's hard for anyone to imagine what the grocery store might have been like unless they were actually there. It was a uh, small building in the neighborhood uh, with uh, no more than, well, I think there were only two aisles. In fact, there was no need for an aisle because the customers themselves did not shop in the store. The merchandise would have been put on the shelf uh, by the owner of the store and you stood behind the counter and a customer would come in to the neighborhood store and ask for a, a certain item. Now, other than like the staples of bread and milk and etc. that you'd, everyone would immediately know where they were, the customer would stand and say, like, for example, I need a can of spinach, and the proprietor would then turn and walk from the counter to the shelf, get the can of spinach, bring it back, and then the customer would say, I need a can of corn. The proprietor or the worker would turn and walk. And so there's no such thing as a help yourself uh, complex, uh, but where the people in the community uh, came and as always almost all on credit, uh, some good, some bad incidentally, but almost always on credit, and uh, no self-service, and uh, if you can imagine it was the days of the old pickle barrel, I started out that way in the cracker jar where they came individually. So uh, it, uh, or came in bulk rather than individually prepared. So I grew up in, in that uh, sort of an influence, and uh, uh, it was a credit delivery store, and that also in this day and age, the delivery service was uh, something that kept the neighborhood stores uh, really alive for years longer than credit did. That was the availability to deliver to the customer who never really had to leave home. And so many times to customers who, in today's age, go to the store once a week perhaps and really buy a large amount of groceries, or maybe in many cases just once a month and just pick up a few items from then on. Uh, when I grew up delivering groceries in that neighborhood store, I, I would be at a customer's house as many as three times a day as they only ordered for that day, and uh, we would deliver it to them. The uh, principal, thing, the principal thing I would like to visit with you about, uh, uh, George, there are three basic areas. One, I'd like to talk a little about the J.C.'s. 
um, during the period you were active in the JCs, and because I know it uh, had uh, uh, quite an influence upon you, and was uh, and many of your friends in the JCs were active in uh, your early campaigns and some still are. Um, a, a second is the legislative uh, period, uh, uh, the period that you serve in the legislature, and then the third is your period as lieutenant governor. Um, why don't we start off talking about the JCs, the McAllister JCs, and then the Oklahoma State JCs? Well, I think that most people would first have to be aware that in Oklahoma, particularly, the JCs, as it used to be known as the Junior Chamber of Commerce, played a very vital role in the growth of a lot of young men in their communities. Uh, being an age bracket of 21 to 36, it was a natural place that anyone who wanted to take civic interest, but who was not ready for a leadership position in, let's say, Rotary Alliance, or Kiwanis, etc., could move into the J.C. And with the national headquarters here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma noted as the young man's capital of the world, it would be quite logical that any young man wanting to be active in civic affairs would join the J.C. That's exactly what I did at age 22. I joined the McAllister J.C. in McAllister. In McAllister, I joined them and became active on the state and national and international level over a period of years. Actually, the, the tenure of a man's activity in J.C. probably would average out about two and a half years. Uh, some lasting only a few months, some lasting for many years. In my case, my activity in the JCs uh, really extended over a great number of years, probably above and beyond, or with rare exception, anybody else in Oklahoma. Because it, when I started at 22, I then continued uh, through the national and international level because I became executive director of a world meeting that would be held in Oklahoma City. So my age bracket uh, was extended because World J.C. is the age of 40. So over a period of about 18 years, I was active in the Junior Chamber of Commerce. And another reason why it was extended is that is that uh, I would participate in local activities, and then my activity in the legislature would prevent me from participating. And so I would come up, come and go. JC member for so many years, but the JCs have meant a great deal to me personally. My closest friends, my closest political supporters, uh, came from this group at one time. Uh, thinking in terms of the McAllister JCs uh, during the period you were with them, or the period that you observed them, can you uh, can you give any of the highlights of uh, projects that took place in Sinai? Well, I, I think I would point out, we were talking a minute ago about how the neighborhood groceries changed into the supermarket. I think it also would say how the JCs have changed in their projects. Uh, used to, it was uh, completely uh, limited to uh, the city parks, the youth parks, uh, cleaning up Main Street, uh, putting on a good carnival, something like that. And then as it evolved through the years, the JCs became also... Uh, issue-oriented in government and activity. So back when I first was involved in JCs, uh, I found myself uh, actively learning how to make my community a better community by being involved in this project. Uh, for example, I know that we had several youth parks uh, built, uh, physically built by the JCs as well as financially. We were involved in the pageants like Speak Up for Democracy, or it used to be called the Voice of Democracy, where we encouraged all high school students to participate in oratorical contests about their country. Uh, we participated in uh, a typical JC project would be the Christmas program, where you'd bring in the underprivileged children to see Santa Claus and have their gifts. Uh, all of these projects were meaningful projects and uh, one that kept you involved in the community. Then the JCs began getting uh, a little more firm in their stand and thinking, well, there were other things, there were other communities bigger than their own hometown. And so they got involved in other issues, uh, such as statewide projects and assisting state government. 
I know that uh, a very minor one, but I thought meaningful one was the state magazine Oklahoma Today. It uh, almost went under three or four times because of lack of support. And uh, JC's uh, always rallied to the cause, and now we have one of the finest state magazines anywhere in the country. And, and on even further into uh, statewide mental health programs and statewide, the, just recently, the Rub Out Rubella program that the JCs are involved in. So I would say that the projects have gone from all the way from keep the city street clean to trying to have a voice in a constitutional convention. So you could take the whole government there on JC projects. In uh, the, on the state level, what are some of the outstanding individual projects that you might think of, or some of the outstanding experiences that you might think of in terms of the organization itself? Well, uh, it's pretty difficult for me to think back of the projects that I thought the state most actively participated in, most outstanding, uh, back a few years because I'm kind of centered uh, around their activities to host the International uh, Convention, International Congress as they call it. And my last four or five years in the JC was, uh, those five years were devoted to the securing of and the carrying out the JCI World Congress. And we had uh, young men and women from some 70 countries of what is known as the free world come to Oklahoma City for their, their annual meeting. Uh, I think this is most significant because we were proud that, one, we had to become the bid city for the United States JC. And in other words, the United States only submitted one town, one city that could be considered for the site. So we first had to bid against other cities in the United States, against New Orleans, and Baltimore, and Los Angeles, and New York City, and Miami, Florida, for example. And we convinced the USJCs that if they wanted the world young men and women to come in and see America, that they couldn't come just to New York and see the World's Fair and go home and say they'd seen America, or come to Los Angeles and see Disneyland and say they'd seen America, or New Orleans and see the French Quarter and say they'd seen America. But instead, we convinced the USJCs to invite them to the heartland of what we consider the, the, the true, uh, uh, typical America, which would be the inland away from the coast and so they came here I and mean, they submitted uh, Oklahoma City and then we had to go to the world meeting and bid against the world capital uh, against Rio de Janeiro uh, uh, against Montreal Canada against some of the other glamour cities of the world and so I would think, think one of the most meaningful things that I've ever been involved in is just the simple thing of getting a world meeting in Oklahoma so that young men of the world could see what the image of Oklahoma really should be. And I thought that was the most meaningful project for our state. Could you talk a little about the convention itself here? Well, yes, they came from 70 countries. Every uh, continent was represented. And uh, interestingly enough, they came in their native uh, dress on uh, many occasions. And basically, they dressed Western style, but we had a couple of events that we encouraged native dress, and it was most meaningful. Uh, the exchange of international ideas was, was most uh, beneficial. Uh, not only did they just they see America and see Oklahoma, but as you sit around the conference, uh, handled like the United Nations, uh, with people speaking their native tongue and you having to listen to an interpreter. In fact, there are three official languages in JCI, Junior Chamber International, uh, French, English, and Spanish. So when you have an international meeting, you have simultaneous translation. And we had, a, like the United Nations, the sound booth and uh, the listening booth and the earphones. And this gave you an appreciation. You know, we sit around here and we think that everybody's like that. If you really stop and think about it, we're just a very small percentage of the world population. And our race is the minority race. Uh, so our country is certainly the minority country. So you see you see what uh, the rest of the world is truly like. Um, the other thing that was important about the World Congress is to keep in mind that in about five to ten years after a JC meeting, those young men will have moved up the line, moved up the ladder. 
and that will be in important positions within their country as well as within their civic activities. The, um, there were no major issues that I could discuss at the World Congress because they stress mainly uh, projects that are non-political so that the, their governments aren't uh, involved in conflict with each other. So it's really just an interchange of ideas about how to make your community and your country a more productive and uh, more forceful place, but not too many activities that you really consider international. The, uh, moving to the Oklahoma legislature, uh, what was your first year of election to the legislature? Okay, I was first elected in 1950, taking office in 1951. Um, Swinging uh, back uh, uh, before we go into the political area, uh, who are some of the outstanding personalities of leadership in the JCs during this period? I'm thinking statewide during the period that you were active in the organization. Just name name a few. You don't have to name them in any order or anything. Well, there were there were so many. Uh, they they go back uh, different years, and I couldn't of course name them in order, but. Charlie Ford, uh, who is now a state representative from Tulsa, was a state president and extremely active uh, in the uh, JCs and the international organization. And Wilson Smithson, an attorney from Chickasha, uh, was the first one who ever even had the idea that the JCs ought to be meeting in Oklahoma as an international convention. And I thought uh, his leadership was extremely felt in the JC activities. My closest associate, associate in the J.C. Uh, well, my closest association was with Joe Johnson, who later became a uh, judge on the Court of Criminal Appeals and served in the legislature, etc. In fact, he uh, was uh, my campaign manager in most of my statewide campaigns. He's now the chief, but the leadership that he gave to the J.C., both including uh, his term as president, but the influence that he gave uh, prior to and after his service as president was the most contributing force to the successful endeavor. Uh, I could go on and, and on and name various uh, J.C.'s. Uh, Lou Allard, now in the legislature, used to be active in the J.C.'s with the state president, and there are several others. The one that um, I'd single out always would be Joe Johnson. Uh, swinging now into the legislative area, uh, you first went in in 1950 or 1952? Well, the election, uh, it's confusing. Election is always in the even years, and you take office in the odd years. So my election was in 50, and I took office in January of 51, and I served eight years. Uh, to January of 1959. Thinking uh, as consecutively as you can, I don't, uh, what were the issues, the major issues before the legislature in 1950 or uh, during that first uh, legislative time? Well, the major issue has always been education and the finance uh, of education and the finance in general. So I would think that uh, I came to the legislature as a school teacher and was particularly interested in that field. Uh, the field of education uh, was of particular interest to me. I came to the legislature as a high school history teacher. But I've noticed that um, if you just want to take it out chronologically, education is always the number one issue facing the state. And it's not the issue of whether or not we want better schools, but it's the issue a little more basic than that, is it's the financing. So if you really wanted to single out any time, any legislative session, what is the number one issue? It's money. And how do you spend the money? How do you spend what you have? And how do you how do you raise additional funds if you need them? Now the educational program has come greatly uh, with progress since nineteen fifty and it's just been so rapid that it's almost unbelievable. But even at that, it's difficult to maintain the same rate of growth that some of the other states have. 
Well, I went through the uh, issue of turnpike, uh, whether or not we need uh, turnpikes in Oklahoma, and I, for one, I am in favor of them. They were extremely controversial in the first few years of my legislative career. Uh, but that was about the only way at that time that Oklahoma was going to ever get four-lane highway, and so I was strictly in favor of it. Um, the repeal of prohibition uh, kept coming up in my legislative career, but I never, uh, it was not taken up during that time it was later, but it was an issue in every campaign, and uh, kept growing in such magnitude until it became uh, so large that it was finally repealed. Uh, the, the problems that faced me as a legislator were concerned also with penal reform and penal appropriations. Uh, being from McAllister, the state penitentiary, uh, being located there, there were a great many needs for the prison program. And since they were prisoners and non-citizens, there were not too many people lobbying for them. And money was so tight and so hard that any time you'd come up with a program for the for the leg for the prison, other legislators would, of course, start screaming and hollering that they had other programs that were far more worthy: crippled children, mentally retarded, uh, the educational system, welfare, whatever it is, and. The argument was, why should we be rewarding those prisoners when we can't take care of the uh, good citizens of the state? So penal reform and penal financing was a major problem, and one with which I associated myself during my legislative career. Uh, the others, I would say, would be the normal, typical problems that any legislature would face. But basically, it always comes back to money. The uh, thinking in terms of the your first session, first and second session, possibly, uh, who uh, are some of the personalities? Some of them may not still be around. Most of them probably are not. But who uh, who are some of the personalities of leadership or uh, are just personalities in general that you might single out in your early legislative career? Well, I think that there are two names that just stick out like glaring examples of, of legislative leadership that almost anyone would have to mention them. And those are Jim Nance and J.D. McCarty. Uh, Jim Nance uh, served not only as Speaker of the House, but President Pro Tem of the Senate and came back and served again as Speaker of the House. I've never seen anyone, and I use the term operate and its fullest sense, operate like Jim Nance did as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, I like him, and I appreciated his service. He was extremely controversial, but he gave a sense of purpose to the House of Representatives. It was always dominated, generally by the state Senate, as being the upper house. And being a House member, I admired the leadership that Jim Nance gave us just in unifying the House members into a body. But more than that, his stamp uh, was branded on almost every major piece of legislation that was passed uh, in the legislature. And uh, he certainly had an influence on you know, in government through his power as a speaker and through his power of knowing those in high positions in state government. The other gentleman that stands out equally, I think, is J.D. McCarty, equally controversial, <coughs> but equally uh, as strong and effective. Uh, J.D. McCarty uh, was known as a knothole gang boy. He was one of the outsiders, and his leadership ability was questioned all the time as a member just sitting out on the floor. Uh, he had the reputation of being someone who could kill legislation, but not someone who could pass legislation. And he tried many times to be Speaker of the House unsuccessfully. And then uh, he became Speaker of the House, and many people who had sat on the side questioning his ability were extremely impressed with his ability to be the Speaker. And every major piece of legislation, again, for the brand of J.D. McCarty. Like I said, he was controversial, and he uh, 
to pass legislation like a steamroller. Uh, of course, when you're on his side, that's great. When you're against him, it was terrible. Uh, there again, I was one of those who probably would have questioned his leadership ability, but he certainly displayed it. And he and uh, Jim Nance are the two most unforgettable men I've known in the world. Going into the mid-50s, uh, before your uh, running for lieutenant governor, uh, can you think of any any other legislative uh, highlights that might be worth mentioning, or any specific experiences that occurred on the legislative floor that might be of uh, either uh, either some significance, or possibly of humorous uh, I incidents, or possibly uh, some sidelight that might be of interest to people listening. Well, of the personal sidelights that uh, concerned my age, because being 22, I was the youngest member of the House and looked even younger than that, and uh, was mistaken many times for a page and asked to run errands and given notes. I was refused my paycheck and and this sort of thing because they always thought I was not a member, but they thought I was a page. This would be employees in other parts of the building. So the funny things that happened to me generally happened to me because of my youth and my youthful looking. Uh, I think that uh, the thing I noticed when you talk about the mid-50s was when the, that was really when the legislature became of age. We'd gone through uh, a, an era of irresponsibility, I think, in the legislature. During the war, the legislature was kind of tolerated by people. But, and then after the war, you, you came along with a uh, burst of everybody trying to take care of the social programs. Colleges were bursting at the seams. The grade schools uh, uh, were just literally uh, uh, not adequate at all. The highway program uh, suddenly was sitting there with two-lane roads, and, and everybody now could afford automobiles, and there were bottlenecks all over the, the state on the highway program. And the legislature suddenly had to get down to serious business and became of age. The character of the legislature changed, the makeup, the personality. And you started seeing re uh, more response. Uh, there again, I was one of those who probably would have questioned his leadership ability, but he certainly displayed it. And he, his colleges were bursting at the seams. The grade schools uh, uh, were just literally... Uh, uh, not adequate at all. The highway program uh, suddenly was sitting there with two-lane roads and and everybody now could afford automobiles and there were bottlenecks all over the, the state on the highway program. And the legislature suddenly had to get down to a serious business and became of age. The character of the legislature changed, the makeup, the personality. And you started seeing re uh, more responsible men 